So I wanted to make sure this, uh, that I was able to be here uh, to talk with Deborah and to have you all here. And as Walter said, we're looking forward to a lot of different types of partnerships. So Deborah, please welcome, uh, not only to DC, but now to the Aspen Institute. Uh, thank you so much, Damien. I have to say that when um, Yo-Yo said, I'm bringing my friend, Damien, along with me for this conversation, I thought, okay, I know him for what he's done, but why is he coming for this conversation? And this was sort of one of those blue sky conversations that you have with Yo-Yo Ma. And as always with Yo-Yo Ma. As one does. Yeah, that's for sure. You never know where you're going to start or end. Um, and I would say that the greatest gift that Yo-Yo Ma has ever given to me, and you can imagine that I've heard a lot of concerts, and a lot of friends, a lot of moments, but the greatest gift that he has given was the introduction to Damien. Honestly, I had no idea, and I kept scratching my head, and I'd tell my colleagues, so Damien Wetzel's coming, I don't really understand why, and I found out pretty quickly. And it uh, has been a great partnership. It, Feels like it's been a little bit longer than four years, but I think that's about right. Anyway, we have uh, great opportunities ahead of us. We do. Um, so it. there's a lot that we can talk about about the past, but I thought that why don't we start simply from a philosophical base? This is the Aspen mm -hmm. Institute, after all. Yo-Yo, mm -hmm. uh, you know, has espoused that that aphorism, "Art for life's sake," and he does that in a in a way that he describes the role of the artist in society role of the arts in society. And, but I was thinking that for you, and I know this is a, a philosophy that you have not only embraced but been living in many ways, now as the head of you know, the Kennedy Center, sitting in the center of government and the arts, essentially, how does that apply in your mind you know, in, a, in a big sense? Are, is, are you bringing that right away, or are you just trying to make, it, make things happen? Because that's a pretty big uh, fight. So uh, full disclosure, um, I, when you spend enough time with artists and you talk uh, with them and you dream with them and you sort of cogitate on what could happen in the world, you own their words, you own their ideas, um, and you try and remember to give them credit. So um, a couple of weeks ago when I found myself using the words um, art for life's sake, the first thing I did when I got home was to call Yo-Yo and say, oh, by the way, I used your language without attribution this afternoon. And um, he said, no, 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 it's not mine per se, but it's the one that we started talking about um, all together, and, and it is really a wonderful one. And I think he used it quite a bit in the, the Nancy Hanks lecture that he did here. Um, uh, I... Um, for us who live in, as I look around the, the room, you know, we're all here because we love the arts. Um, we either are um, working in it, or we're volunteering in it, or we're making sure that it th continues to thrive, which means you're working in it. Um, uh, and so I would say that we all here are believers that it's art for life's sake, and not just art for art's sake. But we, um, all of us in this room, as I look around and think about where we have come from, and some of you I don't really know, but I know that your passion for the arts is what, what, why we're here having this conversation. And we do have the history of having spoken about art for art's sake, the, the fact that the beauty of dance, that the beauty of a work of Degas or a sculpture, in the case of Little Dancer, if I may, um, is the value of the art for the sake of the art itself. But even in the, pl the musical theater work that we are presenting and, and having opening night and tomorrow night for with Little Dancer, it was about art for life's sake. It's the story of a young girl whose dream it is to be an artist, and it is her life, and she will do anything to be an artist. And in parallel, it is about Degas, presenting himself in this fictional piece, but one that resonates with us because we know it to be true, which is that he lives to make his art. So it's art for life's sake. Um, for me, I knew that I couldn't be the artist, but I could be the person who could support the artist. So that's why the great joy for my life and my career is the ability to be around people who have these extraordinary talents and these extraordinary ideas and how can I help them 
uh, become real and how can we share them with the rest of the world so that I can be the other, the yin of the yang and to help with a great idea and the administrative capacity to help put things forward. Well, that's certainly what's happened when we look at Chicago Symphony with your Citizen Musician Initiative, which I hope we'll talk about a little bit. But, you know, that is an interesting tension between that art for art's sake versus art for life's sake that, you know, as a, as a dancer, I've obviously felt my dancing was the point in some sense. So if someone had said to me, well, no, but it also has to have these, these other qualities that add to society or something like that. I very well might have challenged that at certain points in my career. Uh, so there is this odd tension where in this measurement-based society, which is something we push back against all the time in education, uh, you know, when we're asked to provide perhaps evidence that's inapplicable to, to what we're doing, uh, that then we're also calling on it from, from the arts sector ourselves. It's an odd thing. But to my mind, it's, it's a, it's a win-win uh, because I think that what I learned for myself and then what I've seen all the artists that I've been involved in, citizen artists, citizen musician activities, is that the, the kind of dirty secret is you get much better as an artist. Uh, there's, there's such a payoff in putting yourself in a different situation as an artist, whether it's you know something like Story Catchers Theater, which is the uh, theater working in prisons initiative in Chicago, uh, or simply working in a school. And I think that you're right. The, is it the same for an art center in that way? I wonder. OK, well, now, yeah. can I say that in just a moment? But I'd like to respond to your comment about your dance is, is, the, is that the end game? Well, yes, it is. It is for you. You're discovering yourself in that. I'm speaking for you. I hope that's OK. But here's my interpretation of it, which is that you're doing it for you, and it's about a moment of self-expression, or it's um, creating and recreating ideas of other artists. But when you're performing it, it's about we who are in the audience and what is happening to us. And it is about our life that is being changed, either a little bit or a lot. And sometimes it's specifically about observing your particular talent, or it is about evoking other ideas and emotions. And that's the part that's the life part. And so that's why I keep going back to the two of them mean the same thing. And that's why it, it works. It, 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 and, and you can't do if one without the other. I have often told the story um, of, that Pierre Boulez um, shared with me in a, not a dissimilar setting, but um, in over many years of having conversation with him. And somebody said, well, how, how can you tell when they're is a great performance. What separates a, a rehearsal from a performance and a good performance from a great performance? And he, he used a very beautiful metaphor, which is that I stand, I, Pierre Boulez, stand on the podium, and I am interacting with the orchestra. And in a rehearsal, we go through the score, and we work things out just as you would do in a, in a rehearsal. But it's just that. We're sort of putting the pieces together. Then the audience comes in. And I think about it as though I am standing here on the podium with a candle. And the candle is shining a light to the, to the orchestra that is then shining it back out to the audience. And when I can feel and I'm aware of the reflection of that light coming back, that is a performance. So that's why I often say that art is about sharing it with other people. And sometimes it's just one person, but in many cases, and in the case of the Kennedy Center, it's about sharing it with hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And it's a, the art is the act of sharing and experiencing it together. It is not just the art of writing it down or dreaming it up as a choreography. It is about the act of having everybody in it together and that the audience is as important to the art itself as the performers. One of the first things you always talk about, always, no matter what the art form, is how did the audience react? You will always, after a performance, wasn't it a great audience tonight? I could feel their attention. It helped inspire us to do more. Or it felt like nobody was paying attention to us tonight. How come there were so many people leaving or coughing or whatever those kinds of things might be? 
And so it gives you a sense that the role of the audience is really important for the art that's being created. Yeah, whatever that audience is. I mean, I was thinking as you described uh, Monsieur Belay's story and also just in gen the generality of it, that it is about connection. And it's, it's more than that, and it's about complexities of the nonlinear in some weird way. I mean, we're talking about nonlinear things having great effect. You know, what is it about, you know, a phrase of music that moves us? You know, do we need to define it? What is it that that might be effective in a classroom or in another setting? And, you know, what I was thinking as you were talking was that your, your, your role in some way, and I saw this in Chicago certainly, and now I, I, I see it translating here, is to linearly enable the nonlinear yes. to have all kinds of effects, yeah. effects that, you know, we don't know yet. We understand the effect sitting in a darkened theater. We've been moved. We understand that. But beyond that, it's still a little mushy. You know, it's like, okay, there's, what is it about it? What is that? How do we actually take that to another step? So that seems to me in some ways, you know, moving from being a leader in the music world to leader now here in Washington, and it's not just, you know, it's the Kennedy Center, which has all of the weight, but it's also the nas a national opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you, you know, so how do you feel about that, that putting linearness to the non-linearness in this opportunity? Well, what's interesting is that uh, the Kennedy Center is filled with fabulous um, colleagues. I'm not going to call them administrators because they're beyond that, but colleagues who believe in the arts, believe in the diversity of the arts, believe in um, the, the way in which cultures can come together. Hello, Matthew. Um, <laughs> and that um, those extraordinary colleagues who are, who are so good at bringing the linear to the nonlinear, um, that in fact, um, I know that they actually, with me, are interested in bringing more of the nonlinear, bringing more of the artists back into the center of our conversation. So that the Kennedy Center is embodied and more visibly um, uh, the, the living and performing space for artists and that they're at the center of the conversation. Um, that those are the individuals who can inspire us because otherwise we become a booking house and the Kennedy Center is certainly not been just a booking house in, in the last 15, 20 years, but um, increasingly, and I think this is about an aspect of understanding our society today, that we want and need to have the artists to provoke ideas, to provoke discussion, to push the boundaries just a little bit more. Um, I, I really think that in the nation's capital, we have an extra responsibility that the artists are the ones who are making the statements or, and that we're helping facilitate those conversations. You mentioned pushing boundaries. That was another quote, I think, from that, uh, mm -hmm. that article, that you intend to do that in this, in this setting. Uh, and you know, I don't know if there's some specifics you want to talk about or more generalities, but that idea of not being a booking house, I think, is central mm -hmm. to, being, also to being relevant to where you are in any given place. Uh, and this is like no other place. Mm -hmm. So your audiences mm -hmm. are many. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What are you thinking planning wise? So, so I think that it's um, important for us to have a balance um, that we help produce and create and that we support artists in that creation. And I will use an example in just a moment. But that also then we bring in what has been produced and created from around the world. So tonight um, in two different theaters we will have the Batsheva Dance Company that's doing pretty eye-popping, fascinating work, great work that's come from elsewhere that is being shared here. And then in the theater next to it, we are producing Little Dancer, um, which is um, eye-popping in another way. It's a made-up story, and I don't mean to sort of overly sort of focus on this, but we're, I'm especially proud of what's happening because we at the Kennedy Center are putting many artists at the center of a conversation and we're supporting them in every way we possibly can to create something be beautiful and new in an art form that is combining a lot of, lot of different ideas and different art forms. So it's a musical theater piece with a brand new composition, a brand new book, story, b brand new choreography about an artist 
about an art form of ballet, talking about social issues and about personal aspirations. And the fact that the Kennedy Center can bring all of this together, can give the, the petri dish for developing it over a period of time through the workshopping of it, through the development of all of the different aspects, and then have spent the last three and a half weeks really bringing, cooking it completely. I hope it's going to be completely cooked. It'll be completely cooked, right? Um, despite pressure to open it up, and it has been open. You need the audience. So these last three and a half weeks have been about um, giving the, the artists an audience to react, for them to develop the idea further, and then to fully, fully bring it forward. Um, despite sort of the anxiety, please let us see us. The, the press have wanted to see it and have wanted to be let in and have wanted to review it. And we've said, please, we need to allow the artists to do the full scope of their work. My guess is they'll continue to do the full scope of their work, but at some point you have to say, okay, this is it. But I think the Ken this is an example where the Kennedy Center is putting the artists at the center of a project despite a lot of external pressure to do otherwise, we're letting them to do their work, to create it, to, to do what they need to do to create something fully. And that's where something that's special about the Kennedy Center in that we're doing, it's nonprofit, this isn't a commercial venture. This is a place that we um, want to demonstrate to the world that um, the artists can create something really special, new and different. I mean, I'll just throw into that because there's just no way I cannot. Um, that the only thing I think you left out, Deborah, is the extreme level of just excellence and possibility that is embodied in uh, some of the performers in Little Dancer, which speaks to you know what we're doing, what you're doing there. Uh, so Tyler Peck is the Little Dancer, and Tyler is a city ballet ballerina. Uh, she was at my last partner when I was dancing. Uh, so I've known her since she was uh, about 16. And she is taking on this challenge as a Broadway star, and it is not a, a, an opportune. She actually starred in The Music Man uh, under Susan Stroman about uh, 12 years ago, a dozen years ago. So she's returning to something. But to watch her evolve over these three weeks uh, is, is, is actually kind of shocking. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen, have been to a preview yet, but you have to go see this because this is a, this is a modern day, I don't know, quintuple threat. This is something else. And you know, the arts, you know, we could have a long, and we should, great discussion about how the arts progressed through the 20th century. And you could take any art form about what was important when. And if you look at the 40s and 50s in dance, the dancers did everything. Jacques Dumbois did everything. He was on Broadway, he was at City Ballet, he was doing this, he was doing that. Eddie Valella was as much on TV as on the stage some weeks. And that was the way it was. This progressed as the art form progressed, if you will, to this apogee, you know, which really peaked in some way with Mr. Balanchine's death in 1983, where the, the revolution had been institutionalized. It had gone to that point and people became rarefied. And it's so interesting now to see it kind of blossom out again in somebody like Tyler, mm -hmm. who's able to now take that and take it to back to this level. So the and excellence level. Yes, and her husband, Robbie Fairchild, is similarly uh, a principal at City Ballet, starring in American in Paris right now, opening in Paris in December and coming back sister. to New York. Yes, it goes on. So this is a, <laughs> this is a, a thing, but Tyler is something just so special. And the idea of Kennedy Center nurturing this thing is just an incredibly unique opportunity in the nonprofit theater, and we're going to watch it go crazy. So now that I've done my ode to Tyler, no, you no. all. I, set you I think I set you up for that, and I, I, I don't. I, I want to be clear that the Kennedy Center also does book and brings great things from all over, but Cheva dance, not mm -hmm. to, not the least of it. But that I I think that we need to put more artists from a lot more diverse backgrounds so that we don't believe that performing arts equals only you know a handful of what we consider the right things to happen at the Kennedy Center but that we yeah. can have a hip hop festival that is really powerful that some of which takes place at the Kennedy Center and some of which connects to other places in our community
So this is my challenge that I will ask you all to help me think about, is that how can we make the Kennedy Center not just a place, but that it is an idea and that there mm. are people who are associated with it, that people think of Tyler as associated with the Kennedy Center, that they think of Jason Moran, who's this extraordinary, extraordinary artist, our, our artistic advisor uh, for jazz. And they think of the people, the artists who are at the center of the work that we do in this beautiful white building. And, well, what you're talking about is citizen artists, yep. essentially. Exactly right. So these are this is an artistic mentality that goes to beyond simply the excellent performance. What else is there? Where else do we connect? What else is there? And to me, this is the ideal setting. I mean, are you looking as as the steward for these opportunities? You know, with the other institutions here in DC with government it must all sort of be flooding at you like these opportunities to be to act in a citizen artist uh, way essentially yeah. do, do people mean, understand when, what we mean when we say citizen artist or maybe we should talk about it so a good okay. idea do yeah. people would, do you have a sense of it show of hands say yes yeah, yeah. how about no the concept of it thank Doing you for pretty saying good yeah. okay yeah. not so bad yeah. yeah if you truly mean something so. Right. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we take citizen musician then as the colonel? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, these two words, or these three words, citizen musician, citizen artist, artist as citizen. Those, all those words, are ones that have been sort of bandied about by a number of people. But it was really in those conversations um, a handful of years ago that we started using them in combination to think about what the role of an institution and the people who embody the institution in their communities. And it's about um, citizenship and the idea of being connected to your community and giving back and being involved. And um, all artists at one point or another are doing that, sharing their art, um, giving back of themselves. In Chicago, we were thinking about it because we do. We had a long history. Have that it they the Chicago Symphony Orchestra has a very long history of being involved with uh, with community, going back to free concerts in the stockyards, um, and uh, you know young people's concerts at the early part of the 20th century. Um, but how do you talk about it as an idea that can instantly convey a, the concept of artists giving back of themselves through the gift that they have, in the case of the Chicago Symphony as musicians, in the case of Damien as a dancer, and as somebody who can communicate through his art. And the idea is that um, not only are we performing on stage for a ticketed audience, but we belong and live and are deeply rooted in our community, and that we can use the art to convey other ideas, to inspire, uh, to give to those individuals who can't afford to buy a ticket or for some other reason don't have access. And in Chicago, it has exploded in terms of its impact. And people talk about it throughout the city now. Um, so it, it, we've reached that tipping point where people understand it in, uh, very much in that city. And it is a part of the identity of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to the point where not only do they do it in a prison in a suburb of Chicago or in a school on the south side, um, or, but they take it on tour. Um, they do programs in as many cities as they can while they're touring, whether they're for one day or four days, going into uh, nursing homes, orphanages, rehabilitation centers, hospitals, community gathering places um, to give back even as they are touring the world. And as Damien has described, it has changed the attitudes of the musicians. Um, about the work that they do. And if you ask them, by and large, how do you feel about this work, they say, unprompted, it informs my other work and makes me a better artist. So it's pretty extraordinary. When you are playing in a, a hospital room and there are three musicians playing for one sick child and his family, uh, the impact that you can have is really powerful. and. You know, when you're Yo-Yo Ma or Ricardo Muti or the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, you can gather, you can gain attention for that. The attention is really about trying to spread the word 
to get others to do it as well because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of other musicians and artists doing this work every single day. So many people don't know that this happens. The, this is the story that doesn't always get told. It's, it's interesting. I feel I feel relieved that the show of hands was good because I've been kind of I've had a citizen artist initiative for about two years at the institute. So I'm thankfully I didn't get a show of hands that said no. That would have been a tremendous defeat. But the idea that this is a movement is what I hear, and it is. It is a movement that is you know it's spreading from artist to artist, but also from you know, the, 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 the community centers or the health centers or the schools or the rehabilitation centers or the, you know, the idea that this is an available resource. So this is something, and I, I, I actually don't think of it so much as giving back as, com as making communication. Starting something that wasn't there before, a different form of communication is the opportunity. Um, and there's, you know, there are always, of course, thought leaders like yourself and Yo-Yo and uh, Renee Fleming, who, you know, works at the Lyric in Chicago and also is on the board with me of Sing for Hope in New York, which is literally it's a volunteer organization that gives artists the opportunity to do these things. Because what I've always said, and this is where I go and start beating the dead horse, but the, the real crime in this is when it doesn't happen for dumb reasons, meaning no one's going to coordinate it so it doesn't happen. Where the orchestra is on tour, the musicians when asked say, oh my god, I get so much out of this, and it doesn't happen because I couldn't quite figure out how that's going to happen, when everybody's there to benefit. So it's about building that, that linear building of the nonlinear again to make it happen. And you are in a position now, Deborah, where this is... Uh, incredibly possible on a national level to lead that thought and to get it done in, I mean, I can't imagine. So um, a perfect example is the fact that we give a free concert, you all know about our Millennium Stage. It's one of the great aspects of the Kennedy Center. Now, how do we bring that to the next level to deliver even more to the audiences and the performers so that it isn't just uh, here's the, the the stage and there are the seats but how do we make the connection even greater between the performer and the artist so what is the the rule because if we can be a gathering place that we can nurture artists to do this um, even more so that we can be the facilitator to make these things happen how do we continue to do it what's the next step of that I mean to my mind that you know what I'm what we're going to, we are talking about, and we're going to continue to talk about, are those possibilities of partnerships. It was again my first meeting with you was in a room with, with Storycatchers Theater, this organization that does work in the prisons, and literally it was about how do those relationships happen? Because once they happen, things start to happen. It's about how do you make that. So, in your mind right now, I can only imagine what your schedule really entails, but it is a constant stream of connection making. I would think in this city, which will potentially lead to a constant stream of, of processes whereby any artist who comes to the Kennedy Center has this opportunity to do something of a citizen artist nature. And that would be ideal. Right. I really appreciate your saying that because I've had a really wonderful opportunity, even as I look around the room, the people that I've already met, the people I've had conversations with, and my colleagues from the Kennedy Center who are here. And I... I that we will never own all of these ideas, and that would be terrible. The, I, I think the concept is for us all to be in this work together. The more we are all in it and partnering and learning from one another and supporting one another and saying, this is what we're doing. Are you doing something similar? What can we do to support you? So if we can collaborate, can learn from one another, everybody will be that much better off and if we can do it especially in this city and demonstrate to all of the other cities in our country about how collaboration is you know one plus one equals eight very often um, uh, we can do so much better than even the service that we can give to the people who live in our city here I think that's a really important point that this is not this is open source this is about mm -hmm. right. sharing methodology hopefully you know, improving, because one of the great characteristics I always think about the arts is that we edit constantly. We're always trying to get better. We're always, you know, mm -hmm. tinkering. I know the show is going to be frozen tomorrow night. It's not. It's There's going to be, be frozen, it's going to yeah, keep exactly. going. You know, Tyler will still come back and think, okay, how could it be better? And she will fight for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, that's just an artistic habit of mind. That's just what Howard Gardner calls it. Mm -hmm. Artistic habit of mind, just to keep going. So how does that get 
harnessed, but in an open source way. Because you know, one of the things we're working on um, at the Institute Arts Program is toolkits, taking things that work and providing toolkits so they can go out and mm -hmm. people can try them. Right. The Art Strike thing, Sing for Hope's way of going, a volunteer artist goes to a hospital. How does it happen? What does the hospital need to know? What does the artist need to know? What does the coordinator need to know? Go, go forth, do it. Yeah. Most of the work that we do doesn't need to have a trademark. It doesn't need to have a patent because what we're trying to do is help the world be a better place. It sounds very sort of Pollyannish and maybe overly idealistic, but I think that's what is inspiring to me. And so it's not about us owning the concept of citizen artists, but really actually being a role model so that it can inspire others or that we can learn from other ideas. The Story Catchers um, is the, the story of the theater company that goes into the juvenile detention center and works with, in this case, young girls. Um, and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra partnered with them and brings uh, along musicians to work with them to help create their story and then perform it. This is an idea that story catchers began that we jumped on the bandwagon with and there's no reason that we are the only ones in the world who should own this. And it's one that we used in a detention center, in a prison, uh, in that moment because those girls really needed a way to identify who they were and communicate to themselves to their fellow inmates, to their families. But this is an idea that can work under any circumstance. It can work in a school, it can work on in troubled schools and communities. You could imagine doing this in any kind of setting. Oh, in, in, in reconciliation, uh, in diplomacy settings, in all kinds of areas where basically what's required is to understand who you are and who your perceived antagonist is and how you can actually communicate with each other. Right. And it just goes on and on and on. And it's very simple, actually. I mean, the story catcher's method is these young women write their own stories, essentially. So they turn, they help, they get help writing it. And then in, a, in the twist that I didn't expect, the, the genius of it is they don't perform their own stories. They swap. They perform their colleague in incarcerated circumstances story and therein lies the empathy factor that they didn't possess at that moment and they start to recognize their own victimization and how they've perpetrated that potentially and then move forward. I mean it's just it's an incredible process but you could see it being applied mm -hmm. all over the place. You know one of the issues that we had in Chicago uh, that I'd love to have your perspective on is um, when we put the label citizen musician on this activity the musicians sort of resisted it at first because they said you're you're giving a name you're commercializing something that we've done all of our life all of our career why are you taking advantage of the circumstance in this way and um, it, when you use the words maybe cultural diplomacy, you could also imagine that. So we who live in the world of administration and business and that kind of work who put labels to things of ideas like this w could call it in a bigger setting cultural diplomacy. Some musicians would resist and wouldn't want to have those words used because what they're just trying to do is connect and to connect for understanding and connect for appreciation. Um, and yet, um, people like myself can see the power of the art and that connection to do even more. Given, to that, bring, given that, you know, that, you, that you categorize things at times. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. When you bring people of different cultures or different backgrounds together, and to try to build empathy. You can imagine that in any kind of circumstance. But to put a label on it sometimes doesn't always feel as comfortable for the artist. Well, I mean, that's the, 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 the reality of institutions as well. God knows you went through this uh, in many different circumstances about you know, the idea of what is my job? What did I grow up to do? I grew up to be a musician, and now you're adding something, even though it is something I've always done, sort of, and then you put a name on it and you have trouble. I mean, we could use a, a third-party example of the Detroit Symphony, which many of you may know went through a tremendous crisis uh, with a strike that was, you know, front-page news for months and months, and I don't know, if, mm -hmm. I mean, it just went on and on to the point of bitterness and vitriol, and one of the issues was literally this type of work. Should that be in our contract somehow? And thankfully, 
things were negotiated to the extent, and I, if I understand correctly, it literally was that it was in the contract as an option, which tells you where you are. Literally, the problem was it shouldn't be in as an option, but it was. It was in as an option. And in the first year, I think two musicians did it, and now fully half of the Detroit Symphony participates in these things, finding it not only worthwhile, but you know something that they look forward to doing, and it's a big part of their lives. But getting over the hump of some of the what I grew up to do, and this is my job, is is part of this movement's challenge as well. Right, and I think Detroit happens to be a great shining example because it's a place that has overcome all of the tension. Uh, it is a vibrant and healthy institution from the musician's perspective, the management and the community's perspective, and it is because of the coming together. They still make great music, but they also are now much more deeply rooted in community. Um, but you really want to be able to support the artist. You know, when I talk about art for life's sake, it's not to diminish the art at all. It's actually to enhance the level and the importance of the art. Because if I need air and nourishment to be able to live and to say that I also need art to be able to live, it is enhancing it. But there's always this uh, conundrum when you try and use words to describe something that is ephemeral. That's right. Yes. And I mean, if you look at Detroit, I mean, kind of the obvious thing is this is, a, this is an opportunity for them. To, they're in the city of tremendous turmoil but also tremendous opportunity for growth and for, you know, rebooting. And they made the decision to be a part of that, mm -hmm. to embrace that opportunity and to be a part of that city's growth. Uh, we were lucky enough to do uh, the Institute, uh, some convenings there on the arts value in that revitalization. And to see that community banding to that opportunity to saying, well, here's how we can be a part of it. And here's how this is. And they come together is incredibly heartening mm -hmm. because in many ways, this is responding to need. You know what are the needs, and how can how can we respond to them? You know, as a sector, mm -hmm. and as and then as individual artists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to go back to open sourceness just for one second. So now you're the president of the Kennedy Center. Are we competitive with things like Lincoln Center? How do we feel about that level of open sourceness? Well, my, I mean, maybe apples and oranges. My brother but, will. My brother will always tell you that he. Uh, that we have a competition for our parents' love, even to this day. So as I look around the room, and I know how many of you are people who love the Lincoln Center, uh, and also perhaps the Kennedy Center, I will always be competitive for your love, if I may say it that way. But in fact, in fact, we're just different. Um, first of all, the, the Kennedy Center has all of these art forms living every single day within the one organization. And the Lincoln Center, if you don't know it, is an, an, uh, the institution that oversees the, the, the larger place, but it has individual institutions within it. So we have, if I may say, greater power and opportunity because of the intersection of all of the people who are helping bring alive the art within the center. We are also just different because they're in New York and the kind of vibrancy in the art scene in New York, and we are in the nation's capital. You can also say that we would be in competition with, you know, the the Performing Arts Center in um, Atlanta, at Woodruff Center, or the Los Angeles Music Center, or there are many other centers. We're all unique because we live in our own region, we serve a local audience, and we um, do important work, and we generate and create that work as well. Um, in the case of the Kennedy Center, we have a responsibility to the, our local audiences, but we also have a responsibility for, um, uh, as, a, as, as the memorial to John F. Kennedy, to live and advocate for the vision of JFK about the art and society, uh, to be a role model for the arts in our nation and even around the world. Um, this morning I had the opportunity to meet with the Prime Minister from the Czech Republic who wanted to understand how a cultural center um, serves its community, how it is operated, where does the funding come from, what does it do, what does it dream of. And so we have that responsibility and it's really an important part of who we are as well to not just to do the important work of serving our local audiences, 
but in so doing also be a role model for the nation and to be a host for the best that there is nationally and internationally here. I mean, that is a tremendous, uh, I mean, I think of it as a tremendous opportunity, but a tremendous responsibility. When I go to the Kennedy Center and I walk out on the terrace and I read mm -hmm. President Kennedy's quotes and, you know, just that very idea of being at the center of society and what that means, how that is possible and how you can pursue that is tremendous uh, in, its, in its opportunity but also its responsibility. And I think you characterized it very well actually. Certainly there are many centers but well just thinking about Lincoln Center and Kennedy Center you have a, a unique advantage in being able to marshal your forces. Mm -hmm. And yes. to, to in, a, in a single way, move forward, which is, uh, which is wonderful. We've been having really exciting meetings where all the programmers sit in a room together and think about not just what we're doing in the next six months, but two years and, and beyond, and how can we bring the power of all of the different art forms together? How can we coordinate that to make an even bigger statement? And when you bring everybody together, you can still celebrate the great dance that we present or create in our building, um, but that we can draw ideas from local community, international community, that we can have season-long festivals, multi-year festivals, and certainly multi-genre festivals. So it's, it makes a much more powerful statement, I think. Uh, I think we should open for questions, uh, and we'll come back to uh, conclude around 1.30. Uh, if you have a question, yes, raise your hands, but use your microphone, and let's have uh, questions. Okay. Please, Ethelbert first. You're talking about outreach, and I was wondering if you have a special relationship with two of your neighbors, one the Watergate uh, complex and the other George Washington University. People keep saying they're my neighbors, and I keep wondering whether or not they actually live in American University Park where I live. And I subsequently realize that they're always talking about the Watergate. Um, I am uh, getting to know people more and more and getting to know the our, our neighborhood, but m more our partners. So I see a lot of our partners from in, in, in the city in this room here, which is great to see, and I thank you for being here, and looking at opportunities for us to collaborate. And certainly the universities are one of those, and they're very close, and we're working on that. Um, and the Watergate is one of those great opportunities and ones that we actually wish we had more of. You know, wouldn't it be great that we had an even more vibrant uh, set of buildings that were filled with more people. Um, so we'd like to see even more, in fact. Thank you very much for being here. Um, two questions. The ability to really, the outreach and to bring in more in the community might you consider changing the name of your the Kennedy Center and just saying the Kennedy Center for the Arts? It's just one question. Oh, you mean for the, instead of the performing arts? Yes. And to nurturing is so so important, and there really isn't a grand scale place to nurture, and you could fill that void. I feel. Number two, I sent. Uh, Damien, an article that was part of, uh, it's something new for me, there's something Tess's opinion, it's Think, Educate, and Share. So it's Sir Anthony Selden, Master of Wellington College, his essay begins, and education in, our, in the arts is limited to the economically privileged. Is, is it an unjust waste of national talent? So I'm I feel, and I've said this here before, I feel the ability and the access and to a place to nurture is missing. And it's very, very hard for young people today, the emerging people, to be mentored or to feel that they're part of something. And I, I see that you have this great capacity to, through showing, through a name change perhaps, that you are going to be more encompassing in this in area here. So it's just, these are just ideas. And I'm sure Damien can send you this article if he finds right. it. I'd, so. I'd love the article. Sure. And I um, believe fervently in what you have 
have described. Um, in fact, we had a, um, a pretty healthy debate with members of the board in Chicago because some felt that we needed to put all of our resources into the schools that didn't have any arts. Yes. And others said, those are the individuals who will never come to your concert. So you should only invest in those places who are where you will find your future audiences. And I, um, I have a strong belief that all people should have access and opportunity. And even those places that do have the resources, the school districts that have more resources than others, um, don't always still encourage participation in the right way. So sure. it's about participation. And um, I believe that you should have the opportunity to discover all of the arts because of um, you don't know which one is going to stick. Right. My daughter had to take piano because I said you, an education is not complete without studying the piano and then she took up the violin because her friends were playing the violin and um, in the end she's a singer <laughs> that's fine with me and what she really loves to do is draw as well you don't know what you, so you can't force any one thing you need to have all of the options available Absolutely. and um, yes. I believe also fervently that it has to be in the setting where the children are hopefully, all day long, that it needs to be in the school day. Um, there's no reason in the world why it can't be in the school day. Um, it perhaps takes fewer resources to learn how to sing and draw than to, to study history. Um, so I, this is something I really, really believe in. Now, there are a lot of other arts institutions in our city and I believe that um, we play an important role as a partner. But I would hate to lose the performing part of it. I'm sure there's legislation that says Deborah can't make any arbitrary change in any case. And I'm glad you were taking the performing out, not the Kennedy out. But, um, uh, but January. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But but it's really about being a place where everybody can participate. And so, uh, candidly, we do think a lot. And so there are non-artistic things that we are spending time internally thinking about that I hope over time you will see are different that are maybe the place a little bit more welcoming and open to everybody. Okay, thank you. Mayor? Uh, thank you both for today. This is really great and it's so terrific to hear more about your vision and Damien's great work. So you've talked about the transformative value of the arts and working with artists and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about more of uh, your thoughts on audience engagement strategies at the Kennedy Center and how to work more with those folks who uh, get to come and see the shows that you do. Well, it's great to have some of my colleagues um, from the Kennedy Center here because to hear these questions are also inspiring for them as well. Um, uh, when I first got to Chicago, I was I was getting um, I was I was getting complaint letters, which I had, was not used to receiving. And what was interesting was that some of them were saying the concerts are too long, and some of them were saying the concerts are too short. And then I got a whole bunch of them saying, how come there was this young person there, and he was sitting next to me, and he didn't wear a tie? Can you please put into the book the rules and the etiquette for attending performances? And in fact, we have a few of those rules in our program book here that we might just see disappear into the ether because it's about everybody being welcomed. Exactly. Everybody has an opportunity to have the experience. One of the uh, extraordinary programs that we have, um, a really, really beautiful part of the Kennedy Center is the program for the arts and the disabled, the VSA. Mm -hmm. And this is a value that is deeply held by everybody in the center about the fact that the arts are for everybody um, and whether or not you are going to look, behave, um, experience in exactly the same way. So how do we break down those barriers so that um, everybody feels that they are welcome here? So it's about programming. It's about thoughtful communication. It's about an invitation. Um, 
we have some ideas coming forward in the next six to nine months, I hope, that will give you a new dimension on some of our programs and the way in which you can experience the place. Um, somebody recently asked how long in advance do you have to program, so I know you know the answer to this. But um, we are, while we're hopefully going to add a few things exciting, new, in the next couple of months. Mostly we plan six, nine, and mostly 18 to 24 months in advance. So I need a little bit of a hall pass to be able to make <laughs> big changes, but there are things that we want to add that will give new dimension and new opportunity for audiences that they can see a hip hop festival that they feel welcome for. And that's, you can't do it once, you have to do it regularly enough so that people say, oh, I think I could go find that. I'm sure there'll be something interesting for me at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm gonna go to the back, yes, sure. Thank you very much for this conversation. It's really been fascinating and informative. I haven't heard you say anything yet about the international festivals that the Kennedy Center has been putting on for years which have given audiences such an extraordinary opportunity to learn about different cultures. And I, I wondered if you talk a little bit more about what you see in the future. Um, so one of the things is that that I have to learn is to continue to make sure that nobody feels that they're being left out. Because Damien and I have this orchestral connection. I don't want you to think that this has any prominence in my world. And in fact, um, I was trying to suggest that the international festivals are the way we can really bring new ideas that don't have a natural home on a regular basis into uh, the Kennedy Center. So we're, we're about to have this beautiful festival of the Iberian Festival this spring. Mm. And it actually is interesting, Iberian. the Iberian, Iberian, Iberian um, where we will celebrate the art that comes from the Iberian Peninsula and how it has gone out and influenced art around the world and how the art has come back to Portugal and Spain <laughs> and influenced. So we will actually, in this festival, be exploring uh, dance, theater, music that is old and new, contemporary and Baroque at even, um, music uh, from Peru that has been influenced by Europe, um, the Fado dancers who have changed the way Japanese dance takes place. So it's a really important way for us to explore um, the concept that art travels around the world, impacts one another, and then creates something even bigger. So it's not just a showcase of the art and culture of the Iberian Festival, but really demonstrating that art speaks to us from around the world. And this is a really important part of what we do. Um, we will have another similar festival um, celebrating another part of the world next year, and we will continue to have festivals. But we may start exploring these from a thematic perspective, and not just of a country, but to sort of explore the impact of the places on the arts in general and look at themes throughout a year. I think it's so important when you think about that, that idea of connection, that these are multiple connection points in anything that goes on. And oftentimes it's just thought of as though there's a performance. But when you take things on a theme basis or on a festival basis in many ways, you can you can open up the idea that this is a way in here. How, uh, for instance, when we look at some of the work that Silk Road has done, just simply but using geography and the migration patterns of mankind, suddenly you're engaging entire populations in their own story. And that is extremely powerful. I mean, some of the work we do in schools with that has to do with DNA testing. And suddenly, you've just opened the door to everything from literature to music to, to poetry and on and on and on. And in the end, it's about education and being memorable and all the things that enliven one that the unique qualities of the arts can do. Um, so that's exciting to know. So I think the, the, the answer to your question was those are not going away. There's, they may be morphing in various ways, but uh, this, is, this is a valuable asset. Yeah. Well, Deborah, it's such a treat to meet you. Uh, my question is about 
the online presence of the Kennedy Center. Do you have any plans for enhancing that experience? Because I went to see the Carmen de la Vallade, uh, one woman show and I talked with the writer afterwards and I said that was a wonderful show but there's so many choreographers and performers now that a generation has no idea who they are but it's an opportunity to do something maybe in transmedia to dig deeper and I was wondering if there are any plans to expand that kind of programming with Kennedy Center maybe in partnership with PBS Arts or something similar. Thank you for asking that question because it continues to to reinforce for us the importance of uh, the sort of expanded experience. Um, th this falls in the camp of uh, stay tuned, but very much a part of what we are needing to focus on. There are so many more stories than the little program book can tell you, and there's so many stories behind every artist that you that the the traditional media can never tell the full story. In fact, Carmen got that beautiful um, preview article, but you don't always get that. But Cheva didn't get the same kind of preview article that we it, hear in, in the Washington Post because they can't cover everything, and there's so much going on. All of our art arts organizations need to be able to tell our stories in a more deep way. The story of the organization itself, but most importantly of the, the story behind uh, the artist or the story of the artist. So none of us knew until he shared with us that Tyler Peck was his partner, unless we were following him all during that time. But doesn't it give you a new story? It doesn't give you a new insight into Tyler and who her mentors have been, the relationship and how it continues and how it lingers on. That's the, the story isn't just about, oh, they were partners, but they were, they have this ongoing relationship. And that's the story that is, we're lucky that we can use technology to help us tell. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to build the infrastructure, to open up the center, um, to tell those stories, to invest in the technology to tell those stories, both video and written and oral. So I'm hoping that that will become a robust part of the experience that you have with the Kennedy Center so that you can know sort of behind the scenes. I think the team did a really magnificent job giving you a little bit of an insight into the creation of Little Dancer. Really, we will not talk about this exclusively for the rest of my career. But we did give a whole bunch of new stories about this so that you could feel it coming to life. And that we need to capture and tell all the time, whether it's for a two-night performance residency or a six-week residency, every one of those stories need and deserve to be stole, told and then um, re preserved there as well. So I, I hope that you will be excited as we roll this out in, in the months and years ahead. Thank you for that encouragement. Vicki? Uh, just to underscore what you're saying about the audience and the performers having more access to each other. We went to Love the Wham the other night, and the afterwards with the cast was wonderful. Some people in the room probably were there, but they talked not only about their performance and their relationship to the character they were playing, but about their relationships among and between each other and then one of the questions was how did they all how did each one get into opera and it was so interesting to hear their stories and somehow or other it really enlivened La Boheme uh, for us to relate to these these spectacular performers so I'm glad you're doing that and I hope Deborah you'll be able to do more of that more of that um, I think this is a part of how our society is changing we want to know the story behind we want to have that relationship we want to have that connection we don't want there to be something that separates us there is the magic of the stage the magic is really Im incredibly important for us but it's sort of the same kind of experience of we're going to go dressed up and go out to dinner and have a date as opposed to staying at home. Why do you have to do that to have the date? Well, it's still that experience. But in our generation now, there is the desire to be closer, to have a more intimate understanding. And so um, uh, the question is, how do we use our traditional sort of formal structure of a place like the Kennedy Center or any of our theaters that we have to break that down. So afterwards is a way to do that, to have um, the internet help have an inter interview 
so that people can see you to have that. We are um, in two weeks breaking ground on an expansion, the first expansion of the Kennedy Center. And all of the new spaces that we will be building um, will allow for that kind of connection to the artist. And that is the inspiration behind this new these new spaces, which is that there will be windows that you can look in and see uh, artists at work preparing, except when the artists say you can't, <laughs> but hopefully most of the time you can have it open. There will be opportunities for more intimate performance experiences, um, an opportunity to have that kind of dialogue with the artist. So the idea in all of these new spaces, of which there will be quite a number, there is to bring the audience and the artist closer together, to have that relationship. I mean, so I, we'll see. The idea of those, you know, to my mind, it's footholds to some extent. There is the magic quotient where it happens and you experience it and there's that communication which you hope for and you, you dream about. That's why I go to the theater. Uh, but then there's those those other things, the, the footholds that, that you imagine and once you know them, you never forget and you say, wow, there's something there. Now I know something more. It's, and then there's opportunities, obviously, with collaborations. For instance, the, the Degas exhibit that's going on, for instance, uh, in conjunction with Little Dancer. We'll just keep talking about it. Um, but but the, the thing I was going to say about the online, uh, which I'm fascinated by, is I heard Walter say this the other night, that when, you know, you can't treat all media the same. You know, it's not the same thing. That when, when the ability to have movies came along, the first thing they did is film plays, right? That's what you said. And it's like, and they started to realize, wait, this is not the same opportunity. And it started to evolve from there. And it's the same thing with the internet. We started just, well, let's put it online. They, they put it online. No, these are, there's another thing to do here that we're just starting to scratch at. But all those opportunities to add complexity to the experience uh, and, to, and to, the, to the ambition of what we're talking about. The ambition is not only that you enjoy a performance, it is also that you get something more out of it in the end. And just like uh, we can do it, you know, the, the dream for me is you go to a, a museum with a great artist and you walk around. It's just suddenly the, just the sky opens. It's something else. Uh, so we look for that opportunity. Although I think it'll be very scary to go see Little Dancer with you tomorrow night. <laughs> uh, only audibly because of the yelling that's going to go on. Um, Alma, please. I see the time. <clears throat> the time is running out. Uh, but I would like to uh, say that um, for those of us who have been affiliated for over the years with the Kennedy Center, and I've been in a unique position to be a part of this wonderful board at the Aspen Institute and the Kennedy Center. I'd like to throw in a little infomercial uh, for the center, if you don't mind. First of all, I'm thrilled that you're here, Deborah, because this is just the most reliable partner that we could find. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on the search committee uh, along with several other people in this room and in looking for a new president of the Kennedy Center uh, it was very very important that everyone recognize the unique position of the Kennedy Center not only in our city and in our nation but in the world and that distinguishes the Kennedy Center from any other performing arts venue in this country because what happens at the Kennedy Center resonates all over. It's global in its outreach and in selecting a new president we had to have someone who had the capacity to take it to the next level of excellence and to open up new doors, new opportunities, new thoughts so that the Kennedy Center as a representative of the performing arts in America would resonate even more positively and profoundly throughout the world. Our selection was Deborah Rutter and I am very, very thrilled and honored to see her uh, take over the center, put her arms around it and you have just heard this much of her vision. So stay tuned and hopefully 
will have a lot of partnerships going and a lot of things that you want will be happening. Thank you. You're very excited. Well, I couldn't actually close better than that. So it is 1.30, so we are going to close with that. Alma, thank you for that uh, rousing finale. And Deborah, thank you so much for joining us and onward.